Hello, Donna Cato here. Welcome to my channel. And welcome to the Discs Necklace Tutorial. This is the first uh, of, I think, many tutorials that will use the black and white techniques, the things that you you've learned in the black and white series of tutorials. Now, I guess maybe sometimes it felt we'd never felt like we'd never get here, but here we are. It's finally time to use all of the things that you've learned. Now, here's the original piece, and all the techniques are in are in the various tutorials, and a few you'll find in this particular one, these two. But the carving, for instance, the carving piece. Now, I did a tutorial that featured carving. It was the hollow bead. So I believe if you watch that and you watch this tutorial, you'll be able to incorporate this if you wish. Okay. So I guess it's time to get started. And so let's go. Okay, so let's start. Uh, each of my discs is two and a quarter inches in diameter, and the pad below is approximately seven eighths of an inch. I have increased the diameter of the pad below, so the pieces will be spaced farther apart. Now, this necklace has 14 pieces. You're gonna want an even number because you've got the up and down and up and down and up and down happening. So you're probably gonna want an even number. Now, this, as it fits on me, even with the smaller pad in the back and a more compressed and compact design, is a very loose choker. It, it's not very tight uh, on my neck. So my suggestion is if you suspect that your neck might be bigger than mine or you want it a little bit looser yet, don't make 14, make 16 make 16 of these, and I think that you'll probably be just fine. Okay, so in terms of the clasp. Now, that 14 that I told you includes the one that I've placed on top of the clasp here. This is a clasp I designed some time ago. I really like it a lot. It works really, really, really well, but you need an engineering degree to figure out how to work it which makes it totally impractical as something to be sold or to be, I mean, it can't be, a closure can't be so difficult that people cannot figure it out. So um, I would say use your own class. My recommendation would be my class, um, my new class that I designed the template for. That hook uh, closure works really, really well and you could easily put a disc on top. But, you know, that's up to you. If you're interested in the hook closure, um, the Cato clasp, then I have a tutorial here on YouTube. So you can watch that. So having said that, let's get started on solution number one. Okay, to refresh and emphasize, the cutters I am using, this one is two and one quarter inch in diameter, and the pad is seven eighths approximately in diameter. Fit like that, okay? Set those aside. All right, so I've rolled out all my clay. Now for the, um, I'm gonna make the tall one. So the tall one, remember, is two thicknesses of the thickest setting of the pasta machine. Actually, I wrote one, but it, on my machine, it's zero. Number zero times two. And the bottom is one thickness of, uh, of clay rolled through setting number three on my machine. All right. Let's start by stacking these up. So now I have a very thick pad, two thicknesses of setting zero. All right. No, 
Now first I'm going to cut this one. And I would make more, of course, but I'm just going to do one. Now this is a doll needle, I think. It's just a very long needle. And that's what I'm going to use to impress the channel. And remember, one third here, two thirds there. And uh, an approximation is fine. You don't have to go crazy with the measurement. Just going to flatten that out a bit. Pull it out. Now, this has been rolled through setting number three. Pick it up. Place it on the existing pad. And what's, what is important here is that you don't obliterate that hole. So you can do some light smoothing like so, but you want to make sure that you always see that, that little indent, okay? All right, now let us roll. This is a uh, clay I've rolled through setting number five on my machine. And it can be quite thin because of course I am going to be putting some kind of decorative cane work or maybe a pinwheel in it. It doesn't have to be really, really thick. It could probably be somewhat thinner, but I'm gonna leave it. Now I'm gonna take, place it on my sanding sponge and roll it through again, through setting number five. So I have thinned it out. Now I'm going to step away for just a moment. I'll be back. Here's the pad for one of the taller pieces. Now you can clearly see where the layer the layers are okay you've got the thick this is two thicknesses uh, through the thickest setting of the pasta machine and then this is setting number three now at this point the better job you can do of joining and smoothing the better Okay, so just try to really take care of that because it's not the easiest thing to do when uh, the pad is attached to the disc and it's also not the easiest thing to sand. So if you can just very gently hold the pad and take something like this wooden tool and just lightly smooth and pull the clay over so that um, you erase that seam between them. Just makes your life a little bit easier later. Now I can see this sunk just a bit. So let me just insert the needle and see if I can 
pull it up a tad and make it a little smoother. Okay, and this side will be attached to the disc. Okay, so this one is pretty much ready to go. Pretty happy with it. It's not perfect, but I think it's fine. Okay, so we're gonna move on to the next part. So I've rolled my black clay through setting five on my pasta machine. Now I'm going to texture it by laying it on a texture sponge and rolling them through the same setting five together. Peel it off. And now I will cut using my two and a quarter, whatever, the same cutter I've been using. Two and a quarter. All right, so let's take this disc and just press it to the outside of my Ikea bowl. Like that. Now I'm going to take the pad and I'm going to just have to make sure that I put the right side down and the right side down is like this. Oops. Let me, sorry, I have to pull it to myself to see. So that's what it should look like. All right. The channel is close to the bottom. If that hole is up close to the to this to the disc, it's the wrong way, so turn it over. All right. Now, what I'm going to do is secure this to secure the pad. To the disc and I do a lot of this kind of thing I like this tool it's a little nylon tool and it does a nice job so you can see I just joined it right here and I will go around and continue to sort of push the clay from the side all the way down to the disc so that there is no space here between the two of them. Okay, so I will continue working this until it's nicely secured. And I am going to put, of course, many more on this bowl and then they will all be cured in my oven for 50 minutes at 300 degrees. My oven is running a little bit hot, so it's uh, they should be really well cured, which is what I want, because I do not want this pad to pop off of that disc. Okay, so let me load it up and I will be back. Here we are, they're all ready. They are nicely joined, the pads are nicely joined to the discs. Check each disc, make sure that they, that they're not, there's no gap, particularly at the edges. So check the edges out, make sure everything's stuck. And now this is going into the oven. So I'll be back. So they're out of the oven and I'm looking at them and you can see that the pieces have just a soft sheen. So um, the clay is definitely cured. So while it's still on here and it's just a tad warm, I'm going to take a sponge and I've wrapped my uh, Auburnette one uh, Aubernet 80 P 
around it and I'm just going to sand the bottoms of the pads flat. Then I will take them off and sand this area, these sides. You can see how quickly the arbor nut works. Okay, so I will continue. You don't have to watch me do the whole thing, and then I'll be back. Now, I've sanded all the pads flat on the back, and uh, I will take them off, but it really, if uh, it just depends on how you feel about it. Now, you could sand each of these down, and I probably will the tall ones, but the shorties I think I may leave just like this because it is rather difficult to sand them. And also, it's not very noticeable because that disc is so low and so close to the base. So I think I'm just going to sand these all around and call it a day. But you certainly can sand the sides of all of them if you wish. Totally up to you. Now, let's take them off and they will kind of pop off. Hello. Oh, here we go. Just like that. That was a little tougher than I thought it was going to be, but that's fine. So let me take them off and I will sand the uh, sides of the tall ones and then I'll be back. So I realized that uh, probably using my blade like that might have freaked some people out. Like, you probably don't want to do that. I just did it because it's lying here and I uh, I'm not worried about it, but uh, this is probably a better choice. Something like this, just insert it under the edge and then it will come off. It's much easier. You just have to get it underneath, push it all the way down and off they come. All right. This is just a little sculpture tool. Anything like this will work. Just get it under one little part and then push it down and boom, it pops right off. Okay, now I'm going to sand. All right, so I sanded them, sanded there, and then sanded the sides of the tall ones. And I did just a little bit of sanding here on the shorties. So let's drill through one of these, okay? So I'm going to take a drill bit, it's about one and a half, I would say, millimeters. And I'm just going to open it up a little bit, like so. Now I'm going to take the two millimeter bit and I'm going to insert it and I'm just gonna start twisting. And what will happen is once the tip of the bit catches the clay, the bit actually pulls itself through the clay. So you don't even really have to push. And as long as you have that channel in there, that bit is going to go right through the channel for you. Okay, so that's from one side. And now let's enter from the other side and repeat. So you don't really have to do much other than just twist. And as I said, you don't really have to push. All right, there we go. So there's the hole. Let's see if I can find it with my camera. So you see, I'm having a little problem finding it for you. Anyway, it is going all the way through. Yay. Ta-da. All the way through. 
All right, so let's do the short one. The short one might be a little more trouble because, oops, because this part of the, uh, the drill may interfere with with the actual drilling operation. So there's one hole and the other hole is on this side. Okay, so we'll start with the little guy. Turn it over and repeat. The drill is finding its way through the clay. Now I'm going to go to the two millimeter, insert it in the same hole, start twisting. And the bit is now just pulling itself through the clay. And on the other side. Okay, so let me thread this through. Then we have two done and you will do the same with each one. Now let's look at it from the side as we did before. And you see it's nice and flat across the back. So that's how it's going to lie on your skin. Okay. So I'm going to finish drilling and then I'll be back. All right, so this is day two of my editing of, uh, of my tutorial. And you know what, as a matter of fact, I'm not exactly through shooting it, but you know, I uploaded the parts uh, to my computer and then I put them in iMovie. And as I was looking at them, I noticed that when I was drilling, I had a lot of little crumbles around. And if you have followed me at all, and particularly in the carving or other drilling uh, tutorials, then you'll, then you'll know that the presence of those crumbles indicates that the clay is not well cured. So I'm gonna tell you what happened. So I had put all of these on a metal bowl. Now these have been sanded already. Um, and they've been drilled. I put them on the metal bowl and I cured them for a good long time. It's like 50 minutes at, you know, about 300 degrees. And that should have been enough. When I pulled them out and off, I told you that the, the back surface had a nice sheen and it did. It wasn't like blistery, shiny, like some pieces tend to get when they're really, really cured hard. But also this disc was very shiny. And so I took the two to mean that the piece was absolutely, totally cured throughout. And what happened was that parts of it are cured hard and other parts are simply cured. Okay, so let me explain. When you put clay, particularly thin sheets of clay on metal, they tend to get very hot. So you're gonna get shiny spots and you're going to get, you know, this sheen on the surface because the metal takes the heat very quickly. It holds it, it's really, really, really hot. And it doesn't, the ambient temperature in the oven may fluctuate, but I think the metal doesn't fluctuate as much. 
Okay, so I hope that makes sense. And, and any of you scientists out there can either tell me I'm full of crap or what. But that is the way I read it. Now, this is the highest part it was most exposed to the, the, the top of the oven, which is the hottest part of the oven. It, it just has to be, even though I'm using a convection oven. So there are areas of this piece, this thick piece, that are more cured than others. I would say the very center of this pad is probably the least cured. This is very cured because of the, the um, direct contact with the metal bowl. And this, and maybe even the sides, um, are most cured. But when you get to the middle, I think it's less cured. Now, is that a problem? Even though I had a lot of those little crumbly bits, I'm going to look at the holes. That is a nice, clean hole. There was no chipping around the hole. Now, in the past, when I have tried to carve holes into pieces that are really inadequately cured, there will be breakage at the hole, right? I go in and it'll chip away and parts around the hole will chip. And that did not happen. This is an odd-shaped hole, and that is not a chip. That's just where the, the, the layers were not as well joined as they could have been. But the hole itself is fine. This hole is fine, that hole is fine. Now these, this little pad is better cured. There's probably less area here that isn't cured just because it's so short, right? So the heat radiates from below and the metal bowl and from the top. So the pieces that are least cured and the areas would be in the middle here. Now, I'm not worried about it at all. Um, we're going to cure them again. Um, but I just wanted you to know that because it may help you in, uh, in the future somehow when there's perhaps a little uncertainty about the condition of your clay as you're working with it. Now, I'm going to move on. going to move on. And we are going to continue. All right. So once you've cured all of your uh, your backing discs and pads, uh, what you're going to want to do is put your patterned designs in them. First thing is always sanding. So you're going to sand the edges dun, 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 all the way around. And I already did this, but I'm, I'm using very coarse grit. The net. I think this is P80. So it takes the clay down very, very fast. Now I'm going to work on uh, a piece of deli paper. And I'm going to do this one because it's a little bit different. Okay, so I'm going to take and I'm going to cut, cut it, and, and I'm kind of aiming for one millimeter. So I cut pretty slowly and I might not quite make it, but that's not too bad. Now, um, here we go. So it's got to be fairly wide. So I am going to cut another slice of this. Once again, aiming for that same magical one millimeter thickness. I might have hit it in spots, but obviously I kind of thinned out so let's just see if I can put these together. Oh, I should really center this on the paper, shouldn't I? Slide this in, try to get them together. Like so. That looks pretty good. And now remember, we when we made this cane, we reserved some of the 
single element because now we can take it. I made two of these. I hope this is the right one. And we can piece together the pattern. I must have something on my blade. See this or like that? I think that's on my blade. Some little something that's dragging the pattern or dragging the black at that point. Let me see if I can. Yep, I definitely had something there. And I think we're just about there. Let me see. One more. got the whole pattern in there. All right, so now what I'm going to do, is I'm going to see if there are any parts that are particularly thick. It's a little thick spot. Actually, it's not bad, so I'm just going to leave it. Sometimes, you know, I know this one's way thicker than this one, but it's off the active area, so I'm not gonna do anything about it. But I am going to texture it now. Uh, and in that way, kind of press all these different pieces together. So as I'm texturing, I'm actually joining the pieces, which need to be joined because they will kind of fall apart if I pick the sheet up and uh, didn't do this. Okay. So you just do the best you can. That was a little thick there and that's why there's a little pattern distortion. Okay, that's pretty good. So I'll set these aside. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some poly paste and put it inside. Now you can use liquid clay too. I just happen to have poly paste sitting here. But liquid clay will do the trick as well. Ta -ta. Okie dokie. Now let's cut. And I'm just going to slide it underneath me for just a moment. OK. 
Okay, I think that's pretty good. And let's cut, remove the excess from around. Peel the paper away. Turn it over. Put it in. And then from the middle, start pushing to the perimeter. So you try to push any air pockets out. All right, so this, let's take a look at this because I'm not really happy with it. First, I'm just going to take my blade and trim away the excess. Okay, now I have a decision to make. See how thin it is on this side? It's a lot thicker on this side. Now, how unhappy does that make me? Um, if I were selling this, I would just have to do it over because that difference in the thickness on one side to the thickness on the other really isn't, isn't acceptable. Now, what I can try to do is I can try to thin it more by pressing. And of course, that does alter the scale of the pattern as I'm spreading it out. But let's see if I can make it better that way just by kind of pulling the pattern, just physically thinning it with my fingers and then texturing, then trimming. It is getting thinner, but it's still the difference between the thickness here and the thickness here is pretty substantial. So, you know, I, I don't know. This is this is just a judgment call. This is a judgment call for each of us to know whether that is a tolerable difference. Is it tolerable to have one that much one side that much thicker than the other? And the answer is going to be different for different people, I think. I think in the context of the necklace we're doing, I don't think it's a huge issue because we have so much going on, so many different things to look at, that maybe someone detects that one difference and doesn't like it. There are people who whose attention to detail is that fine, but I think most people would not even notice. But I just point it out because it is something uh, that you should think about. So putting a pattern is in is that simple if it's caned. It, it's even simpler if you have a pattern like this, for instance, because you will cut slices, lay them out, join them together, texture them. And because you use the pasta machine, they're going to be exactly the same thickness. I would say work on paper like this because you can get the clay off quite easily as opposed to working here. But you know, it's a most likely the pieces that you're um, pressing to the discs are going to be larger, larger than the discs themselves. You see, even though I used this cutter, it was the, the clay was larger. Anyway, so that's that.
And um, let me think further about whether I should do any other particular pieces that might depart from this basic method of working. Okay, so I'll be back. So after showing you the basket weave and how I did that, uh, I decided there is a need for me to talk a little bit about the two basic different kinds of canes you're dealing with. Uh, one is like, well, these two that have a very specific pattern. These are canes that you're going to cut individual slices for, and you're going to put them together and enlarge the pattern, as I did here. Those are this. But then you have another kind, this. And the way I choose to deal with these is different. I take slices, and let's say I'm going to do this one. So I'll take several slices, and they tend to be maybe two millimeters, like so. I'm going to work on paper again. And I'm going to take these and I'm going to thin them through my pasta machine. I think they're almost wide enough. Let's see. All right. So, getting two. Oops. I have to cut another one. They're two uh, drastically different in thicknesses. You see, each of the thicknesses that you're going to thin should be the same thickness to begin with. I did it again. Okay, wait, maybe I should just set that one aside and work with these two. All right, so I'm gonna roll. Oh, setting three, setting three, setting four. Okay, setting four, as it's long enough. All right, so now I'm going to just put these slices together. They're a little curved, see the curve in them? Well, that just means that this side was slightly thicker than this side. All right, so I'm just putting it down. I'll take my brass rod and roll try to join them, but I think a better way to join them is actually to go back to the texture sponge. Just texture like so. Let's take and cut. Remove the excess. Once again, apply the poly paste. Now, I'm not really thinking about uh, too much about where in the piece these are going because I do not know. But when you're doing the this part, you should know. You should have an idea of what you want, which patterns you want to go where. For purposes of this demonstration, I'm just grabbing anything and putting it anywhere. But I don't think that's the way you're going to work. Because when you work, also, you have to be aware that this has a grain, right? Do you want in your piece for it to go up and down? Do you want to go sideways? Do you want it angled? Well, these are things you'll decide. The hole is here. Okay, so let's pretend that it mattered to me. <laughs> okay. <sighs> well, let's just do this one. I've strung it, so now I know how it's going to hang. 
So if I want this to be perpendicular, I will perpendicular to the cord, I will position it so that it is. And I can look at the cord and I can see I need to pivot this slightly to the right, right? If I want it angled, then I will just simply move it until it is in the orientation I want to the cord. So that's how that works, okay? Now, since this is my demo, I don't really know where it's going to go, so. Just gonna drop it in. Like so. Okay. Take my blade. and just trim off the excess. If necessary, you can just take and retexture and one thing that you can do with these that will help in terms of any uh, air between the clay and the, uh, and the base is to take an acupuncture needle and just pierce some holes. And these are just opportunities for any air that might be between the raw and the cured to find its way out without forming uh, a bubble. So I will do the same thing here. Just put lots of little minute holes using an acupuncture needle. There you go. So now you know that there are basically two different kinds. Well, actually three. The third would be a sheet, something that you make as a sheet, maybe a silk screen or even something like, you know, our color replacement patterns like the pinwheels and the lopsided circles. But that's how we deal with these things. Okay, so we're moving on. So in our necklace, we have a couple of oddball pieces like this, these incised lines, and this. I like this one. So I'm going to do this next because you deal with it two different ways. We have our two solutions or two methods. Well, you deal with this in two ways as well. So let's get started. I have sanded the edges of my cured backing. So this is uh, method one or solution. I don't know why I said solution, but I did anyway. Now I'm just going to cut and I've rolled this through setting four on my pasta machine. It is an atlas. It starts at zero. And I have lint. All right, so press it in there. Very good. Take your blade, trim around the edge. And we're ready to start. Okay. Now I'm going to be using this ball on this ball stylus. 
you know what, it's a little large, but I'm going to use it anyway. What you don't want to use probably is something that's too small. If it's too small, it just you don't have the same effect. So use something this size or a bit smaller. Now you're going to work from the outside in. So just take and follow the edge like so. And please note, I did soften my white clay quite a bit because this is one of those techniques you want. I want this ball to glide through the clay. I don't want it to cut, and I really would be happy if it didn't bring up lots of little dry bits of clay and uh, softening the clay with my uh, conditioning bar really helps with that. Just take your time. And of course the ball stylist does pick up little bits of clay so they end up in my palm. Go over it just a bit. And there is the first row. Now I'm going to move in. and start the next. And just do the best you can. Um, I've never made a perfect one ever, ever. We are not machines. Second, and then Third one. And then you can retrace the others every once in a while. Now I will continue. I probably have another three or four to go and then I'll be back. So I finished and you can see that I put a little dimple in the middle. It doesn't always happen. It just depends on what the spacing is. Sometimes they, have, they are there and sometimes not. Now I'm going to take my blade and trim around again because I know I pushed more clay out to the edge. And you're gonna set this aside and this will be cured with the rest when they're all ready. Okay, so this was that first method where we only bake the black and white elements once. So what do you do if you're working the second method? The second method where you're actually taking cured pieces and setting them after. Okay, so here we go. Um. 
same setting. I've rolled this through setting number four on my atlas. I'm gonna take my cutter, cut. And, you know, I usually put it on the inside of a bowl and, uh, and do it that way. But let's try something a little different. Let's try working flat. My fear was always that the clay would lift off the paper and I would end up with a mess. But this is fine, it works. Put the clay on paper Then incise around, starting at the outermost ring, and work your way into the center. Okay, and just keep going like so until you have all the rings done. Now, once they're all done, what you're going to do is you're going to take the bowl. This is the Ikea bowl. But this time, put the clay on the inside. just like you will do with all the other pieces that you are going to need if you're doing method or solution or technique number two. You're gonna be curing them all and you cure them on the inside of the bowl. Okay, so let's move on again. So moving on to the next little oddball is this. I really like it. It's just a disc with holes in it. Okay, so let's make the disc with holes. Uh, so this black clay has been rolled through setting number two. And what I'm gonna do is I'm actually going to roll it through like so. I made a clay sandwich. I'm gonna roll it through my, my machine. Still on setting two, but I have textured both sides at once. Now I am going to take my cutter, like so, and you know what? I'm going to make, I'm just going to take a little piece of clay that I cut with the pad, the pad cutter, and I'm going to just place it on there. and. I'm not pushing it on there hard because I don't really want it to really stick, stick, stick to it. I just want it there so that I don't cut, so that the holes I cut are not too big. Okay, so let me get my cutter. And this time the holes will be slightly smaller because if I use, actually, I don't know where this, that size cutter is. The story, oh, I found it, I found it, there it is. Okay, so here is this cutter, the cutter that I used here. So now all I'm gonna do is cut the holes. the best at this spacing thing. I'm really not. It's kind of embarrassing. But I, I will just do my best. 
see, I am so far off. Okay, but I don't really care, so. <laughs> so now I'm just going to pick it up and I'm going to pop all these holes out. Dun, dun, dun. Da, da, da. Get out. Get out, get out, get out. And I'm going to go to my handy dandy bowl that I put the white one in. And I'm just going to lightly tap it into place. This will be cured and then the back will be put on. So this is kind of the one piece that you have to do the second way. I have, I mean, you could do it the first way, but I think it's, no, you have to do it the second way. Okay, so we're moving on. Now we're going to start the second method or solution number two to uh, creating our pieces for our necklace. Now, this is cured. You must start with a cured uh, focal piece. And I sanded the edge nice and smooth. This should be done with every piece. Now, let's look at the thickness. This is not the thinnest piece you've ever seen. And so I can make the backing quite thin. It doesn't have to be very thick at all. If this piece were very, very thin, then I would, of course, make it thicker. So I've rolled this through setting number five, but I think I'm even going to roll it thinner. Let's go with six, because as I said, this is a little on the thick side. All right, setting six. Now what I'm going to do is place it on my texture sheet. rather texture texture sponge and roll it through at the same time now this particular piece is going to go across the back and up the sides so this is the original cutter that I used so I'm going one up one larger and I'm going to cut okay now onto the back, of course, I'm going to put my poly paste and I'm sorry, I should have done that first. This is the type of thing that you really don't need to see. Of course, you want that poly paste to go up along the edge. Okay. I was just in the garden. I think my hands have a little dirt on them. All right. We'll survive. All right. So let me try to get this on, centered on the piece. Let me see how I'm doing. Well, not the greatest, but not too terrible. Now, what I want to do is I want to make sure there's no air between this backing clay and the cured pinwheel. Okay, so I got rid of that. Okay, so now what you're going to do is just gently push the clay up around the side of the pinwheel. Like so. Aww. And I'm going to take my blade and I'm just going to glide it across the top cutting the excess clay away. Mm. Just 
just push that out just a bit. I don't know why that came in. So now I'm going to take this, turn it over, and onto this in the center, I'm going to put the pad. Now, if this is the tall one, and it is the tall one, I've just decided. This has been rolled through the thickest setting, cut it in half, because remember, we need two thicknesses through the thickest setting of the pasta machine. Now I'm going to cut one out. I'm going to take that little needle that I, <laughs> I lost. I, oh, here it is. I remembered to put it away. How unusual. And one third down, push it in. can even flatten it a bit if you'd like. Remove the needle. This has been rolled through setting three. One cut out. Place it on top of the others. Make a nice stack here. And you know, last time I didn't really do this, and um, I, I really should have, but you can just take some straight-sided tool like this, my brass rod, or you can take a big round stick or a knitting needle and just roll around the edge. Might help. I think it helps a little. We shall see. And position this, centering it. And of course, if you, when you're doing it, you will look and you will decide hmm, which is up, which is down, where should the piece be threaded, and then you will make your decisions based on that. Then this is not. This is not uh, an exact thing. I, I don't know how to make it exact in, uh, with our method number two. Now in number one, yeah, you saw how pretty clearly that could be done because we strung through. You could see how it would hang. Then you could see exactly how you wanted to position your decorative black and white sheet. In this case, no, it's more an approximation. I don't know that you'll ever make it exactly where you want it. Now, the rest of the procedure is the same. You're gonna take your tools, you're gonna pull down and really secure that pad to the disc, okay? Like so, do exactly what we did before, smoothing the best you can and really tucking all of this clay down so you don't see any space between the pad and, uh, and the disc, all right? Now, once this is secured and you're happy with it, you're going to bake it. And what I would do is bake it face down in a bed of baking soda. So we'll get a nice big baking dish, something that will fit all the pieces that you are curing at the same time, and put them all face down in the powder and cure. And I would say you should cure at 300 for at least 30 minutes. And then, after you're cured, let them cool. Then take them out and sand so that they look as good on the back 
as they do on the front. Okay, that's the goal. That's the goal. I don't know. I wouldn't spend like a lot of time on that, but that is the goal. You want the back to look as good as the front, especially if you're selling your work. You know, I have a lot of pieces here that I made with it, and never intending to sell them. They are just for me. And so in those instances, maybe I'm a little less particular because it's only for me. All right. I really like uh, this tool a lot. It's doing a really nice job. Remember never to obliterate the holes, the channel holes. You really need those because you're going to be drilling through those holes later. All right, so here we go. That's done. This will be baked face down in the baking soda with all its other friends. All right, let's move on. Here is the necklace. I have strung all the pieces. Uh, and, you know, if you want to uh, to make sure that the pieces don't move at all, you can just put a little drop of glue at each O-ring and that will keep them uh, situated and they will not move. Then there's no way that they can slide on the cord. I don't think that's necessary, so I don't do it, but uh, it, it is an option. For instance, if you find that your O-ring is a little bit large, that it's not really holding the pieces in place, well, then you might find that you actually want to do that. Now, I want you to pay attention to the way they're strung as well. Remember, each of the pads had a third. This stringing does not go straight through the center. Remember, it's a third and two thirds. So you want to make sure that you string them all so that the third third, 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 and the two thirds are all below. You don't want to mix this up so that you have one that is two thirds, ex one third exposed, followed by another one that has two thirds exposed. They just don't hang right. They don't hang right. You have to make sure that they are all in perfect registration. Now, I added two to my necklace. I added this one and I added this one. And now, uh, this will now hang a little bit lower on me. If I take them off, then I have something that's kind of a tighter choker. Now, if I were to take them off, I would make sure that I had a low one at on each side. So maybe I take these two off and then I've got low, if you see what I mean. Because the clasp is going to go between the two that are last in line. And because these, the clasp tends to be tall, you wanna make sure that the adjacent pieces are actually lower rather than taller. And here's just an example. This one hasn't even been baked, but I'll give you an example because it is tall. So here's a tall one, and this is the way the clasp would then sit and it wouldn't compete at all with these because it's rising above. Okay, so that's what we're gonna do now is the clasp. Now I have a tutorial on how to make this clasp. It is my hook clasp and it works very well. It's very easy to use, it's easy to take off, it's easy to put on and it's quite secure. Now, I went back and I figured out how thick uh, ideally this should be. Now, you remember our little, my drawing, uh, it had two thicknesses of the thickest setting and one thickness, thickness of number three. Now, I altered that a bit. I don't think it's going to make any difference. This is through setting three, the bottom, the two sides are through setting three, and then the middle area and the hook are two thicknesses, two thicknesses of number three. And this is thick enough for me to drill into because I'm gonna glue my cord right into this, okay? 
There we go. Now, um, I can see that, you know, I have to do a little bit of sanding here. So let me sand this because you want this to be perfect or as perfect as possible before you move on to actually putting whatever disc you're going to use on top of the clasp. Okay, so I'll be back. So I have sanded this edge all around. I sanded the back and I sanded the front. Now I'm gonna be covering up one side, so I'm gonna cover up this side because it is definitely the worst of the two. I think I can sand this away, I can get this. And you know what, if it was really terrible on both sides, then I would just take a very thin sheet of black clay textured and put it on both sides. As it is, I'm only going to put it on one side. I'm gonna put it on this side, which is the bad side, because that's where the decorative disc is going to go. All right, so I've made this very thin. I rolled it through setting six in my pasta machine, and then I rolled the clay together with a texture sponge, okay? I've done the same here. Now, let's just start with this first. So I'm just going to take my poly paste, and I'm going to Put it on this side and just mush it around. Don't need that much of it, but uh, you do want to get it all the way to the edges, like so. Now I will put this on. Oops, sorry, I went off kilter again. I really do think about it, but then I get so caught up in what I'm doing. And honestly, sometimes when I put it <laughs> perfectly in front of the camera, then I can't see it myself, which is a problem. So this is where I should be. So let's just trim the excess away by sliding the blade around. And now when this cures, this nice sheet of black will be well secured to the clasp. All right, if I didn't do that, would not be as secure. All right, so let's talk about what I should select as a decorative piece on top. Now this I uh, cured, this is silk screen, that's white paint there. So the advantage of using this one would be that that white paint is not gonna change. You know, clay, remember clay changes. Now this is raw, so it would only be cured one time, but nonetheless, you know, I don't know if I will cure it exactly the same as the others. It could darken more. It could, I mean, there are a lot of things that could happen. So for me, in this case, I am going to take the silk screen because it's not going to change. Okay. Now let me take and put my poly paste on it. Poly paste is wonderful stuff, but remember that after you cure it, it does not cure clear. All right, so let's take this thin sheet and just press it to the back. All the way to the edge. Okay. And as I did before, I'm just going to take the blade and just slide it around and cut the excess off. Okay. I'm 
I'm not too concerned about air bubbles between, but I might as well just take these acupuncture needles. I just took three and I sunk them into a piece of scrap clay. So I'll make a bunch of pinholes. And those are, of course, the areas or places that give the, the air, if there is any, an opportunity to escape. All right, so let's get this on. I'm gonna try to center it and then push, push it on. Okay, I'm gonna keep pushing because I wanna make sure that these two pieces are really pressed together. raw to raw clay so that should be a very good bond all right now I'm going to take repel gel and I'm going to put it on the hook I will insert the hook and then it will be cured like this. Now the template has another piece that you can cut, but I'm finding that I can just actually use the hook as long as I put Repel Gel on it and uh, straight out of the oven, I plunge it into cold water and then I loosen and remove it and, and it's never been a problem. So let me cure this. I'm going to do the same thing. Uh, I will push this. Actually, I'm not going to push it down. I'm just going to cure it just like that. Now, I could put my signature cane on. Maybe I'll do that, and then I'll cure it. Okay, I'll be back. Okay, now we're going to glue the clasp onto the necklace. I have drilled my holes. Of course, started out with a smaller drill, then moved to a larger one. Now, when you're drilling into the actual larger part of the clasp. You just have to make sure you don't go all the way through because you have, oh, maybe a distance of about that much before you bust through the bottom. So try not to do that. Now, um, I've got, because I'm right-handed, I'm gonna put the hook in, the, in my right hand. I position it so that when I put it on, I will engage the hook with my right hand. Okay, so I'm attaching the larger part to the left side of the necklace. Now I'm gonna take some CA glue. And I'm gonna see if I can get, oh yeah, okay, okay. And I'm just gonna put a drop right there, okay? Now, I think I've said this before many times. I'm a terrible gluer. I am not a good gluer. Uh, I, I don't know. It's a problem of mine. Okay, but I think I have enough glue there. So I'm just going to take my cord and push it in and push it all the way down. Now, I have an O-ring also I threaded on. So I'm going to push that O-ring right down to the clasp. So I'm gluing the O-ring to the outside of the clasp. I think this is going to help keep it on there. So I've got the glue all the way in the hole and I have the O-ring on the outside. Now I can slide the other pieces up and this is how I get my spacing. Slide it up so that it sits where I want it to. And that looks pretty good. Maybe it's spaced a little farther out, but that's really okay. Now I will scoot the rest of them down. And later I will adjust the O-rings if necessary. 
Okay, so let me get that done. And when I come back, we will glue the hook. Okay. Okay, so I spaced them out. And by the way, that was easier from the back than from the front. So what I did was basically take one, slide the ring up, slide the piece up, slide the second ring up, and then repeat the process. Okay, so now I'm going to put the hook on. The hook is engaged in the clasp here. And I can see that that is probably about right. See where that O-ring is? I think that the spacing will be good. Now, what you don't want is you don't want to make it so tight that you have no opportunity to make minor adjustments. So I'm going to pull this back just a little bit. Not much. doesn't have to be much. But I can then, because I haven't glued all the pieces down, I can change them. I can adjust the spacing a little bit. But you just don't want it to be too terribly tight. Now, this one that I made before... I think is too tight. I think it's really too tight because when the pieces are not in the proper orientation, it's kind of a struggle to get them into the proper alignment. So I think that this is much better. Using a larger disc or a larger pad on the back actually turned out to be a much better choice. It's going to be a much easier piece to adjust and to wear. All right, so that's where I'm going to glue it. Now I'm gonna take this, and it does not have to be engaged for this part. And I just pushed it all the way in. And that is how much it will go into the clasp. Now I will do my best I think it's about right there. And I will cut. Now let's put this in. And that's pretty good. It's not all the way up to it, but as I said, I want a little bit of play. And I can easily absorb that little bit in the whole piece. So let me slide this up to the base like so and just as i did on the other side i have this o-ring here so the cord will be glued inside and then the o-ring is snugged up against it now i like putting this so that the hook the open part of the hook is actually down in other words i put the hook in and when I'm wearing it, this little this little piece protrusion is actually, well, let's see. How is this going to go? It's actually down. But this piece actually can be, works in either direction. Okay, so it works in either direction. However you feel most comfortable. If you want this little nib at the top, in other words, toward the base of your, uh, of your head, toward your skull, then you will put it this way. If you want it down toward your lower body, then you will position it this way. All right? I hope that was clear. It wasn't quite clear to me at the moment. This, this is one of those things that is probably better and easier if you turn it around to the right side and then you can make your decision the way it's going to go. See? So it's actually easier if you flip it to the right side. So this is the way I'm going to do it. I'm going to put that hook facing my skull. Okay, once again, the world's sloppiest gluer is at it. Glue, glue, glue. Ooh, see, I almost had another one of those tragic glue moments that I have been known to have so often. And I will take it. Oh, I'm going to take a little needle and... Just kind of push it down in there. Da, da, 
10. Uh -huh. Then I'll put this inside. And then snug that O-ring right there against the base of the hook. Then I'll put the lid on my glue. And once that cures, let it sit there a while, then it's done. Then it's ready. Okay, so um, I think that's it. But with me, you never know. I could be back uh, before the end. But I hope you've enjoyed our black and white series. I will be putting up more ways to use the things that we made in the series. Perhaps a bracelet. Maybe we'll make some pods, hollow pod necklace, something like that. But I have plans to use more of these. So there will be more classes on how to use them. In any case, I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you so much. If you've enjoyed it and if you've benefited from it, then please like and subscribe my channel. And until we meet again, I am going to say goodbye. Bye.